Today's show of the Final Straw Radio Show is a re-airing of Burst's conversation with Corey Doctorow. Uh, this originally aired in 2018, so some of regular listeners of the show just enjoy this blast from the past of some of our older naming and intro paradigms. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you're free to do so. Just send us an email if you end up using any content. You can find radio-friendly versions of this show of 59 minutes in length by visiting archive.org and searching for the collection called The Final Straw. If you care to, you can send us letters at our new address, The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, that's 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816, USA! This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville, specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week we're presenting an interview that I conducted with sci-fi and picture book author, technologist, and social critic Corey Doctorow. Corey is an editor of the blog boingboing.net, a fellow at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and his most recent book is entitled Walk Away, and it's out from Head of Zeus and Tor Books. The novel plays with themes of open source technologies, class society, post-scarcity economics, ecological remediation, dropout culture, and liberatory social models. It was released a few days ago also in paperback, along with matching reissues of his other adult sci-fi novels. For the hour, we chat about themes from the book, about sharing, imagination, privilege, and monsters. To find more work by Corey, check out his blog, craphound.com. You can also find him on Twitter. You can find free versions of his writing at Project Gutenberg, as well as interviews and recordings that he's done at archive.org or his podcast. Links will be found in the show notes for this episode. Due to technical difficulties, we have no Sean Swain segment for this week. We hope this will be remedied next episode. And just a reminder, for a slightly longer version of this episode, make sure to check out the podcast version. Also, stay tuned midweek for a podcast special interview with a couple of anarchists from Indonesia about the May Day that occurred in Yogyakarta and the repression that has followed. We'll also be hopefully talking about the wider story of anarchism and current organizing in Indonesia. Also, if you haven't been checking out our podcast feed, you're missing out. We've been regularly releasing extra content midweek, including our 8th anniversary episode with interviews from hosts of two Channel Zero Network podcasts, as well as two episodes of Era 451, our sometimes weekly tech security podcast from an anarchist perspective. And stay tuned also for the audio of our 8-hour live radio version of Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World from the conference of from the gathering of the anarchist radio network that just occurred in berlin germany if you're in Asheville this week consider attending the another carolina anarchist book fair benefit show at the auditorium on haywood road on the west side the show starts at 9 p.m it features the music of Cortriba, mother marrow lycanthrope and a special battle set of the project fatal comfort versus the stylings of I don't think we can say that word on the radio. Funk jams. If you visit the ACAB table, you could be one of the first one of your friends to grab an ACAB 2018 poster, hot off the presses, or ACAB 2018 t-shirt, both designed by super awesome local artists. Proceeds from the entry, shirts, and posters go to pay for the local anarchist book fair taking place between June 21st and 24th. More info on the book fair at acab2018.noblogs.org. Also this Friday, the Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross will be hosting its monthly presentation of the short documentary series Trouble by Sub.media. This month, we'll watch the second episode of Two on the topic of gentrification and resistance to it. The film will be 30 minutes and then followed by a discussion with prompt questions suited to the Asheville's specific brand of problems. This show starts at 6.30 and will last roughly about an hour. Invite your friends. We're joined today by Corey Doctorow. Uh, Corey is an editor at Boing Boing Technology and Culture Blog and is a journalist and science fiction author. His most recently published novel is Walk Away. Corey, thank you very much for taking the time to chat. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for your interest in the book. It was a really pleasurable read. 
One thing I love about speculative fiction is finding the roots in the current world, looking at the divergences between the story and the IRL, and playing with those imaginary threads, tying them together. Walkaway mentions Idle No More, The Arab Spring, it alludes to Occupy, and even like old Back to the Landers, and I think it was Vermont. From this sort of history of the future view, what agency is given to resistance movements of today or just yesterday? Oh, that's a really good question. My theory of change is that uh, we get to a better place, not by laying out a plan that takes us from A to Z, but by taking uh, immediate steps that in some way materially improve the circumstances for resistance or change, that then creates a more favorable landscape from which the next volley can be launched. So. It's a lot more like a, a software hill climbing algorithm where you don't know the terrain, and but all you do is you always try to move up to to more favorable terrain rather than, you know, this idea of like a knowable world, a kind of, you know, the, it, maybe this is where I break with Marxism and its so-called scientific theory of history that has this kind of deceptive and seductive inevitability about how we, about how we can chart a course. And instead of charting a course, I kind of advocate for a unified heuristic, right? The same, the same, we all, we all use the same rule of thumb to try to make things better. Uh, and the material improvements that we make just in some way benefit the people that come, come in the future in some unknowable and unguessable situation. So rather than trying to lay in the material needed for a battle whose contours we can't predict, we just try to make things as as um, versatile and usable as possible for whoever comes next. And so, in this future, I think the people who are who are on the vanguard are people who are picking up the stuff that we left lying around without knowing exactly how it would be used. And some of it turns out to be useful in unexpected ways. And some of the stuff that maybe we predicted would be most useful turns out to have no earthly use. That's really well said. That actually, that kind of reminds me. So I, I had mentioned in, in one of the emails that I was uh, interested in and had been looking into Cooperation Jackson recently as a project happening in the deep south of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's like an initiative to grow a tech industry and manufacturing and, and fabricating belt, employing the mostly black and working class populations in a democratic, almost permacultural approach. Uh, it doesn't seem like mm -hmm. perfect, obviously, but they've really laid out their plan really open source style in this book called Jackson Rising. They're influenced by Rojava, by the Mondragon Cooperative, by Black Liberation Struggles, by the Zapatistas, and, and many other diverse movements. Are there any current anti-capitalist anti projects or movements around the world that are hacking and, and making that inspire you or that you're keeping close tabs on? It's a really good question. Again, I know I keep saying that, but these are good, thought-provoking, meaty questions. I'm sure that there are explicitly anti-capitalist projects. I mean, Dmitry Kleiner and the Telekommunistens in Berlin spring to mind. But I'm interested in the way that projects that don't have an explicitly anti-capitalist agenda nevertheless can serve the cause of a post-capitalist or even a mixed market technological future. So things like free and open source software, the movement for net neutrality, um, cognitive radio technologies, uh, things like end-to-end um, uh, -end encrypted messenger clients and, and also, not incidentally, the, the tools for evaluating all of these that, that like we're getting into better um, trainer training tools and better um, uh, critical frameworks for understanding them. So EFF, with whom I work sometimes, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, has historically published scorecards of different kinds of security tools. And they've stopped doing it for end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messengers because they realize that you, there, isn't, there isn't a dimension on which uh, an encrypted messaging tool is best. Instead, there's different kinds of threat models for different kinds of users. And, um, and so what they're doing now is they're publishing plain language, easy to understand uh, models or, or you know, kind of frameworks for evaluating what kind of encrypted messenger you should use and understanding whether any given encrypted messenger is one that you should trust and that you would find useful. And to me, in terms of um, aiding insurgency, which I guess is what all these things have in common, they're not explicitly 
uh, they don't have an explicit political valence, but they have an anti-authoritarian valence, that these tools are really useful. And I think the, the place where, again, like if I break with the Marxist left on, on uh, like the inevitability of history, maybe the place where I break with the intersectional left is on whether a tool can be made to benefit insurgents that doesn't benefit insurgents we don't like. You know, the alt-right is an insurgent movement as well. Um, and I, I, when I look at movements to throttle the alt-right, I always concern myself with the extent to which that will also throttle anti-authoritarian left-wing movements. Uh, you know, for example, any framework in which it becomes easier to remove content from the web on the, uh, on the basis of the pol politics of its speech, I think has to be viewed very, uh, with, with extreme caution not because there isn't speech that that uh, is bad speech or that the world would be better without, but because the ease with which speech can be removed based on its content is um, uh, a threat to anyone who wants to say anything unpopular. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's kind of funny, like now now becoming personally old enough, I'm almost 40 to have seen to seen this trajectory a couple times. But seeing, for instance, I'm in the U.S., um, seeing Democrats be in office and then seeing Democrats allowed to push certain boundaries or increase incarceration rates or deport more people or do drone strikes without any sort of repercussions to the executive branch. Um, and then a Republican administration follows directly after, you know, it's, it's terrible when it's happening when the Democrats are doing it, but um, there seems to be some un, like a lack of understanding to some people that what, the the tool is going to be wielded by someone and you don't get to choose necessarily who wields that tool whether or not it's yeah, immediately I, positive for or quote unquote positive for your goal or not yeah i think that's right i mean i think that um you know liberals uh Amer the american liberals were pretty sanguine about the extension of of really extreme executive power to obama when he was using it to fight you know, the hard hardline Republican, like TGOP Republican Congress. Uh, and now they are about to, you know, have the, the their past sins visited upon them, not least because, you know, there's there's like now the power of the president to create um, secret assassination lists, you know, that that a certain kind of liberal defended in the in the last administration. Um, but, you know, also, as you say, mass incarceration, the failure to close Gitmo, um, you know, and so on and so on. A lot of that kind of triangulation, Clintonian political stuff uh, is is now like it's it, they've become they 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 went from like convenient instrumental doctrines into like pluripotent immortal weapons that now get to be wielded by whoever sits in the president's chair. And we have a, a maniac with a lot less discretion sitting in the president's chair. You know, I'm not going to stick up for Obama, but I, I do think that if nothing else, he was circumspect and um, premeditated in a way that Trump isn't capable of, which at least allowed us to have a kind of threat model. You know, I always like to distinguish when I think about threat models between like the cat burglar who plans a robbery of your house because they know what kind of jewels you have hidden in your wall safe. And that time I parked my car in Gastown in, in Vancouver, which is um, the her principal port of heroin ingress into the Americas. And uh, I left a quarter sitting on the dashboard and someone uh, broke into the rental car in order to steal a quarter. And, you know, it's possible to, like, think about that jewel thief in a way that, like, rationally defends against it. Like, if the jewel thief's expected return on st selling your jewels is less than the cost of breaking into your house, you can secure your house from the jewel thief because they don't want to waste money. Whereas the junkie just is is acting without any kind of premeditation and is very hard to defend against. And when we think about like political threat models, Obama at least was a, was predictable, right? Like we we knew where he would squander capital and where he wouldn't in in, in his political in the political sense. Um, whereas Trump picks dumb fights, and you know a uh, uh, a loose cannon on deck is much scarier when it's a really big scary cannon than when it's a a small constrained cannon and Obama made the president into a much bigger cannon. Yeah. <clears throat> With the aid of, of the American people. So you mentioned that you're a fellow at the, at the electronic frontier foundation and a lot of your writing focuses on tech tools, 
for more secure organizing and for knowledge sharing and resisting tyranny. Prince's little brother, um, as a novel focused in a large way on ubiquitous surveillance and the socialization of resistance via, for instance, parties where people shared encryption face to face. The book was both a commentary as well as a spur to get folks thinking about resistance with actual models of going about it. Can you talk about your views of the cultural and acti activist interventions that you engage with, like how they overlap? Well, culturally, there is a an anti-authoritarian streak that is um, built into the internet. It's not like determinative, right? It's not like using the internet makes you anti-authoritarian. But if you have anti-authoritarian tendencies, there's a lot that the internet has to offer you. And much of what gave us the internet, as we understand it today, was anti-authoritarian. Like it may have had its roots in things like BBN and the Rand Corporation building, um, you know, command and control networks for the U.S. military. But its early users and the people who sketched out its contours and built a lot of its... Um, you know, built a lot of its infrastructure and, and a lot of its norms and a lot of its like embedded technological assumptions did so at, out of a, a posture of anti-authoritarianism. And so culturally, anti-authoritarianism is not an end in itself uh, because, you know, anti-authoritarianism can lead to the like, what do you mean I'm not allowed to say racist things and rape people? Uh, you're not the boss of me. But anti-authoritarianism as, as a, an axis on which to plot other politics, I think, make, like, I think good politics are better when they're anti-authoritarian. Uh, that, you know, the people who are suspicious of their ability to, to tell other people what to do uh, and the likelihood that they'll get it right produce better outcomes than people who are convinced of their, um, of their, of their uh, you know, infallibility and their right to, to, to dictate to other people. Uh, and so one of the places where I guess the, the politics and the culture of the internet overlap uh, is, is in that anti-authoritarianism. And if they're, you know, like going back to Marxism, you know, Marx had this idea that, that being alienated from your labor made you uh, susceptible to being talked to about the problems of labor alienation. And I think making your friends and and enjoying the world through uh systems that are intrinsically anti-authoritarian or that that have anti-authoritarian roots makes you into a good candidate to talk to about anti-authoritarianism you know there, there are no atheists on the in a foxhole well it's harder to be an authoritarian on the internet it's not impossible clearly but like as compared to other systems uh the internet um because there's so many workarounds. Uh, coercion. Right? Yeah, the coercion on the internet is hard. And not only that, but um, people who have benefited from the inability of others to coerce them uh, have then gone on to build other systems on the internet that make coercion hard again. It's not impossible. Like, I'm not, I'm not pretending that, like, Twitter mobs aren't coercive. I'm just saying that Twitter mobs are, are an aberration as compared to like many other systems that exist to, to kind of uh, evade coercion. And when you, you know, I, I, one of the things that I concern myself with a lot is what I think of as a historic revisionism in which we say that um, early internet uh, optimists were naive about the power of the internet to be, to be uh, a force for bad. And I, like, I happen to know those people really personally. And I, and I'm, uh, extremely aware of, of what they had in mind. I was there when they were doing it. I was talking to them about like, what are we trying to do here? I was working for them and drawing a paycheck from them. And their view was not, the internet is automatically going to be great. Let's, uh, let's all like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's raining soup. Let's, let's fill up our boots. Their view was the internet could be unbelievably terrible. Let's make sure that that doesn't happen. And so, you know, when John Gilmore said the, the internet interprets censorship and routes around it, he specifically meant that people who operate the most anti-authoritarian parts of the internet, which at the time were alt Usenet feeds, um, whenever someone tries to censor Usenet, do these specific things with the protocols that underpin it and with their own human effort to make it harder to censor. And, they, and those tools might have been developed 
to route around damage, to route around drop nodes in an unreliable network, but they work extremely well to fight censorship and the people who develop them um, are, are ready and willing to do so because they view censorship as illegitimate. And so like that's, um, that's a, a, a powerful force. And it's one that the story of the internet's early uh, proponents as being naive fools, uh, it, it weakens, right? That one of the things we have on our side as we work to make the internet safe for human habitation, a force for, for, for good and human thriving, is the uh, ethos that the internet should be that. And when you turn your firing squad in a circle, and say that the people who fought all along for a free, fair, and open internet just didn't understand how the internet would go wrong and shouldn't be listened to, then what you do is you, you, you make it harder to achieve the free, fair, and open internet that we want. Uh, and you do so out of a kind of petty, personal um, uh, satisfaction that, that you get from telling other people that they're idiots. So there's this this kind of reminds me of a this this part of the book that I keep thinking about and that keeps resonating with me is a very interesting way of engaging with some of these ideas. But so just to bring up a couple of characters, um, there was Limpopo and Ginny, Jimmy. Uh, Limpopo had put in a hell of a lot of work designing and building and doing upkeep on a sort of way station and home for people who had started walking away from what was called default or or mainstream society. Uh, in this dystopia and people collaborated uh, there with, you know, to create a new life with others. Jimmy comes in as this intel like intelligent, brash, proud young man <clears throat> who believes in meritocracy and wants to leverage a position of power at the compound called the B and B for himself by riding the coattails of Limpopo. Uh, there's also some gender norm dynamics that one could unpack from the way that it goes down in the story. But can you talk about what inspired you to, to, write this out and what um what you hope readers will get from the debates and battles like these that happen in walk away well so in some respects that is me correcting a a, a sin of my own um which was that i wrote this novel down and out in the magic kingdom about the ambiguous utopia of, of meritocracy that like reputation economies uh where i posed reputation economies as like uh, not unalloyed good, but as something that could be uh, actually pretty terrible. Uh, and um, uh, and people took it as like a, 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 a manual for, you know, how to build the future, not as a um, not as a cautionary tale about how things could go wrong if you use uh, if you use that as your starting point. And uh, and so I wanted to show the ways and I wanted to, to make it less ambiguous, the amb the ambiguous utopia of a uh, of, of a reputation economy. I wanted to make it more explicitly uh, dystopic. So 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 as to, you know, heighten that, make it make it visible, make it make it harder to miss. Um, and, and I think I did that. <laughs> I hope I did. And uh, I also want people to to think a little bit about the um, you know this this starting starting life on third base business that um, you know that that when you when you say someone has done very well objectively uh, and that there's no um, you know there's that 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 something that you've measured is bigger for one person than it is for another that there's a false uh, quantitativeness that misses out on some qualitative elements, which is which are the uh, the um, all the social stuff that goes into that person's life, all the all the reasons that they are that they're overperforming relative to their peers. Can you break that down a little bit? What you mean? I mean, I, I saw you talk about, or I, <clears throat> I saw you uh, had responded to a Q and A from a um, the big bookstore in Portland. Uh, and naming your your memoir something about like I'm a I'm a privileged white dude who's I, I don't, I'm I'm misstating that uh, basically but right. can you can you talk about unpack that a little bit more about what you mean about where people start from um, why they perform in certain ways and the sort of invisibility of privilege yeah I mean in some in, I I mean I expect that anyone listening to this is familiar with this story but I'll tell you it like from my own personal perspective so you know my my grandparents were not um 
did not come from a, a place where they had uh, a lot of privilege or power. My, my grandfather was raised on a, on a farm in a part of Belarus that later became Poland. Uh, my grandmother was raised in Leningrad and, and my grandmother was a child soldier who was inducted into the Civil Defense Corps during the siege of Leningrad uh, at the age of uh, 13 or 12. And she served for nearly three years and then they, they evacuated the women and children over the winter ice. And she met my grandfather in Siberia when she was inducted into the Red Army. And then the two of them deserted and went to a displaced persons camp in Azerbaijan. And that's where my dad was born. And they came to Canada as displaced people. But Canada had, uh, at the time, a pretty well-developed social welfare network. And it made sure that my dad got a first-class education. And uh, there was also... Um, relatively few large businesses that dominated the sectors that they operated in. And so my grandmother's second husband was able to start and operate a, a successful scrapyard that gave him the power to go to university, which was also publicly underwritten. And as a result, even though both of my dad's parents were functionally illiterate, he has a PhD in education. And that's why I grew up in a, in a household where in 1979, we got an Apple II Plus because by that point, he was head of computer science for a large high school. And Apple came along and gave all those heads of computer sciences Apple computers to take home for the summer to convince them to not have um, mainframes, to not do time sharing on mainframes in their computer science courses. My, my dad had been teaching with PDPs that they time shared on and punch cards. And as a result, I had a modem in 1980. I was active on bulletin board systems. I was in on the ground floor when the internet came along. I was able to drop out of university and walk straight into a job in, in a new tech sector. I did very well by it. By the time I was like in my mid 20s, I was earning as much as my unionized parents were. Uh, and, you know, without a university degree and all of that arises out of privilege, right? It's, you know, I got, I got incredibly lucky by being born when I was born. I got incredibly lucky by being born to who I was born. And some of that luck was not just about the great forces of society, but about explicit redistributive, um, uh, practices that in, that were intended to ensure not just a quality of opportunity, but to a certain extent, a quality of outcome. And that was enormously beneficial to me. And so here I sit in Southern California having uh, previously emigrated to the United Kingdom and attained citizenship and then moving to the US and getting a green card through a relatively simple process because I qualified for an alien of extraordinary ability visa that transitions very easily to a green card. And we've just bought a house and we can afford that house. And we've spent a bunch of money on a remodel and all of that. And some of that is because I write good books and work hard but the reason I get to write good books and work hard and earn enough money to do all those things is because a bunch of forces that are way beyond my control and that are not well distributed uh, bore down on my progenitors. And this is how we went from my grandfather, whose mother was kicked to death by a cow on a dirt farm, to me living in a renovated mid-century modern bungalow in Burbank, California in two generations. It wasn't by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. It was because I got to start life on second base. And so, you know, when I look around at other people who are trying to do what I did, who are trying to become successful writers, who want to become activists, who want to get involved in, you know, other activities that, that um, uh, require uh, a relatively high degree of, of technical specialized knowledge, as well as the comfort from which to uh, take risks. The reason those people don't have that is not because of an innate failing of theirs. It's because I am a privileged white dude who got incredibly lucky to be born who I was, and they weren't. So uh, do, you, do you read a lot of sci-fi yourself? I do, although like I think a lot of people who read a lot for pleasure in their 20s, by the time I got to my 30s and 40s and became a dad and had a career and so on, my reading for pleasure or even reading for professional purposes, uh, plummeted. Uh, so I do a lot less reading now than, than, than I used to, but uh, I have a chronic back pain problem. And uh, so I swim for an hour every day and I have an underwater MP3 player. So I listen to about two novels a month through my swimming. And then I probably read two more a month uh, or two more books a month, um, sometimes novels, sometimes not. If they're novels, they're usually science fiction. Uh, as well as a few graphic novels. And 
uh, I get sent a lot because I write young adult novels and, and also I've got a picture book coming out. I get sent a lot of kids books for review or for quotes. And um, I have a 10 year old. And so I just throw them in her room. And if she reads them, then I read them and review them. Uh, she's kind of like my, my first approximation sorting function. And so I, I, read a, I read reasonably broadly, but you know, when I worked in a science fiction bookstore, I read a lot. And I know exactly how much I'm not reading because I know how much I read back then. Does your daughter ever contribute to the uh, the quotes that go on the covers of books? Yeah, funnily enough, one time uh, I got asked to write a quote for the sequel to a book that she liked a lot called um, Dragons Beware or Giants Beware. Uh, the sequel is called Dragons Beware. And... Um, I, they sent it to me as a, as a PDF. So we read it together off my screen and I told her, you know, I'm going to make a quote for this and they're going to put it on the cover of the book. And she said, I want to send one in too. So just for yucks, I sent it to the editor and the editor cut my quote in half to make room <laughs> for hers. So we got sent this track I'm about to play from the band Noxy, which is spelled N-O-X-E, which is a German anti-fascist group. And this song is called Anglerfish off their recently released album Finders Keepers. You can read all about them in the show notes and hear more of their music at noxy13.bandcamp.com. Well, I was asking because the, there were parts of I I really like political sci-fi. I'm kind of a one-trick pony, so I just kind of gravitate towards reading about ideas around politics and around social engagement and social organizing. Um, but uh, a novel that I was reminded of at some points with Walk Away was March Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time. Have you read that before? Uh-huh. Um, sure, yeah. Especially for its its counterposition of a utopia and a dystopia in struggle with each other, although her vision definitely had text serving a visibly more ecologically healing role uh, rather than what I saw in Walk Away as a sort of, like, mitigating during this, like, hardcore struggle between default and Walk Away worlds. Um, it was more... It, I saw more people creating... Um, creating livable structures and creating the tools that they needed for immediate survival, as opposed to in Piercy's book, maybe it was, would have been a little bit further on where people were trying to, you know, heal landscapes, um, for instance. But um, uh, bah, 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 bah. also it contained more non-human animals than I found in Walk Away. Did you, hmm. and maybe I missed it, but was there like an ecological bent in Walk Away or was it, more focused on just this is the destruction this is the us needing to survive and create something new well i mean walk away if if you know if, if we've been warned about disaster capitalism by the likes of naomi klein walk away is is uh in some ways uh 
up pain to the possibilities of disaster communism. And so, you know, the walkaways are one of the things that they're doing is they're using the catastrophic remnants of environmental collapse as the raw material for a better world. And so the fact that, uh, you know, one of the one of the great challenges to a transitional program towards a more broadly distributed future is is the property relations and the difficulties of expropriation. I was just on a panel in Australia at a literary festival with um, uh, an African woman, a white African journalist who had um, risked her life to report on uh, uh, authoritarianism in Zimbabwe and had been exiled. She, I think she was actually born there. Maybe, maybe it was another regional country. I think it was Zimbabwe. And she was talking about the ANC's proposal to expropriate white farmers and redistribute their lands and about how that had been a real disaster in Zimbabwe for lots of reasons, partly because um, uh, sophisticated agricultural knowledge wasn't widely distributed and partly because of the lingering resentments and the difficulty for reconciliation and so on. And and so we talked about it and I said, well, you know, like, let's talk about some other decolonization efforts that had land reform in them, right? So you have like the Cubans who, after the revolution, bought land at market rates and you know it's not like the exiled uh uh you know elites of cuba in miami therefore forgave them and didn't harbor generation long you know intergenerational grudges against the cuban republic for having taken away the family farm uh you know you have you have uh american whites in the south that who still are you know nurse these um these horrible grievances about um, uh, about the the antebellum period and and you know land land changes after that and so on or post war period and land changes after that yeah. and so yeah so you know it's like it's very hard to get people to feel okay about these changes in in um, land ownership and moreover it's very easy to activate grievances. So even if people seem to have forgotten about them for a generation, they can be reactivated by reactionary political actors who want to use those grievances in order to, to raise a political, um, you know, a political uh, uh, movement to pursue some reactionary program. So like think about the Baltics where, you know, by, by exploiting these old grievances, it was possible to to uh, create a, a civil war that still, you know, has reactionary, uh, like neo-fascist um, nationalist in the Balkans, elements. Sorry, who? Yeah, in the Balkans, yeah, who who like never fully lost the power that they gained by exploiting those those old divisions. Um, and so, you know, I I think that one of the things that the book proposes is that. Uh, if you know when life gives you SARS, you might try and make sarsaparilla. <laughs> and so the fact that the fact that like environmental catastrophe has basically rendered a bunch of land to be um, uh, to be uh, uninhabitable and, and undesired by anyone uh, means that walkaways can, uh, with a relatively low risk, just sort of show up there and take this blighted no man's land and turn it back into something worthwhile. But of course, the thing that they discover is that as soon as you rehabilitate something that no one wants, all of a sudden they rediscover their property interest in it. But the thing that they exploit in it is that there's so much blighted land and remediating it is so easy if you don't care about profits that um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as they work the, as soon as they build something viable on some blighted land and some oligarch comes along and says, hey, that's my patch of blighted dirt and I want it back now that you've made it attractive again, they just move on to another pl um, patch of blighted dirt and do it all over again. And in fact, they like each one of these is an opportunity to, um, uh, you know, remake, overcome their previous mistakes and do more ambitious things and just refactor things. It's like they, they're in some way benefiting from uh, not having that um, status quo bias that normally happens in things like free software projects where no one wants to start over. Uh, and refactor things from go because it's just so much work and you've got so much sunk cost in the in the status quo but if someone comes along and just wipes out all your source code every six months 
provided that you really still need the thing, provide, you know, like shelter is not optional, so they have to go build shelter somewhere, and they just make a virtue out of that, um, out of that vice. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome setup in the novel, and, and it, yeah, it's really inspirational, the scope of of the book and of all of the different um all the different social conundrums that you're trying to at least touch on and play with how different elements of for instance like the free university that's developed that um is escalating people's knowledge and technologies and and trying to improve on things all the time um because you've got people that are disenfranchised from mainstream society and they choose to leave but they bring this knowledge and this ability with them um, and put it towards a collective good. Uh, yeah, there's just so many examples in the novel. I can't, I can't stop gushing about it. Oh, well, thank you. And, you know, I mean, I think that that is, uh, whenever, like, science fiction does have this tradition of these stories about um, someone having a, wielding a technological power, an enormous technological power because of their special knowledge, uh, who nevertheless doesn't have political power, and how the people with political power uh, coerce the people with the technical knowledge into working for them. You know, how does the, how does the, like after civilization collapses, how does Master Blaster in Thunderdome get the mining engineers who actually know how to like, you know, convert methane to, to a useful source of power to work for them? Or how does, you know, how do the, um, the, the techno, how does the technical staff of Immortan Joe get incentivized to work for Morton Joe instead of just like walking over to the next Arroyo and living without this, this tyrant. And, you know, the, I telling it from the perspective of, of um, people who did have this, this uh, rare, not widely distributed, extremely powerful technical knowledge, finding solidarity with the, um, with the people rather than the oligarchs and and taking that technical knowledge and spreading it around that's you know that's actually like um a thing that that happens right i mean that's the story of crypto party and it's the story of uh lots of people who uh you know have the ability to just work for big tech companies and instead or in addition devote their lives to um, uh, social justice causes and to widely distributing their specialized knowledge. And, you know, in this case, you have this, this scientist class that reaches a, um, that reaches a breaking point with their paymasters where they realize that the kind of practical immortality technology they're developing has the potential to speciate the human race and make their bosses, not just powerful, but immortal and to deprive everyone else of immortality and that once everyone else is immortal, once everyone else does have, uh, can't be killed, then the ability of the, the wealthy and powerful 1% to coerce them becomes uh, significantly reduced because how do you coerce someone who's not afraid to die? And so, you know, as these people start to defect to the, to the side of the 99%, uh, it, it becomes uh, more and more obvious to the ones who remained that what they're engaged in is something morally indefensible, and that not only is it morally indefensible, but it's morally indefensible, and there's an alternative. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is M1, M-A uno, M-A de la gente comprende y entiende, you feel me? I'm one half a dead press, to tell it like it is, everything is political, rap duo. Here holding my middle finger up to imperialism worldwide, and you in tune right now to the rebel beat. The Rebel Beat is a monthly podcast of radical political music across different genres and across different continents. It's the mixtape to a riot against police brutality. It's your nightly newscast set to bass and beats. It's protest anthems from Hong Kong to Istanbul to Ferguson to Montreal. Give it a listen at rebelbeatradio.com or subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms. So that's that's a thing in the book that I found really interesting, too, is that I don't hear many people talk about post scarcity economics. And I'd, I'd like to talk about the technologies of, of immortality that are talked about in the book. But, um, you know, this holding with 
so hierarchies are based on the withholding of something or other from uh, from people. People build hierarchies, but social hierarchies that exist in society, whether it be the class-based ones or the way that gender power is appropriated throughout society or racial castes or whatever, is about privileges being withheld from other people, people being disprivileged. Um, and one of the very basic and time like from time immemorial ways that that happens is the withholding of the means towards one's own yeah, like ability to have shelter ability to have food ability to take care of one's loved ones um can you talk about what made you start thinking about post-scarcity economics and maybe some um some influences into your thinking around it well going back to this idea about like the cultural nexus of um you know, the cultural and political nexus on the internet. It, you know, one of the things that the internet does is uh, challenge, uh, it, at the same time as it supercharges it, it challenges rentierism. Because uh, the ultimate in rentierism is, um, is, is the idea of so-called intellectual property, which is the idea that you have a thing that has no tangible existence and that through its creation generates a, a passive income uh, and um, all you have to do is just sort of sit there and wait for it to roll in. This is one of the ways that like this fight that, I, that I'm engaged in on the policy side about DRM, I think has this wider significance is when you go back to the early literature of intellectual property in the Chicago school, you find this kind of metastatic, uh, uh, you know, metastatic uh, choice theory where like this idea that um, uh, someone who owns an in, uh, piece of intellectual property could use some magic technology dust to infinitely divide that um, intellectual property into a series of products that are ever more uh, tailored to the uh, to the to to different audiences. So, like maybe you don't want to spend the full freight to read a book anytime you want. Maybe you just want the right to read the book on Wednesdays while standing on one leg. And the market can produce this uh, standing on one leg Wednesday price through some price discovery mechanism. And then the technology somehow sees to it that having acquired the book, you can only read it on Wednesdays while you're standing on one leg. And it's one of those things where, uh, like in a lot of technology policy fights, the answer uh, is in part wanting it badly is not enough. So we don't know how to make the technology that only lets you read a book on Wednesdays while standing on one leg, even if we stipulate that that's a good idea. But, you know, um, once you swallow a spider to catch the fly, you have to swallow a bird to catch the spider. So once we accepted that that would be like this market in the future and that the way that we would have like these passive incomes in a post manufacturing society where the WTO allowed all the manufacturing jobs to be offshore to China and the, the um, West would remain wealthy by means of um, exporting the intellectual property to China that would then be turned into physical objects and then brought back into the West. And that it would be like rent seeking on the people making the things by owning the rights to the plans to make the things or the, the images that are embodied by the things or whatever, that the West would remain, would, would remain economically dominant. It became politically in a, impossible to say, we don't know how to make a technology that stops you from reading books unless it's Wednesday and you're standing on one leg. And so instead, we started trying to approximate it. And the way that we ended up approximating it is with um, technology that, uh, that just spies on you all the time, right? And that, and that uh, is designed, you know, computers that are designed to not take orders from their owners, but instead to take orders from third parties uh, and without even informing the owner what the order is or, or allowing them to rescind it or terminate it. And, you know, this has like wider implications for information security, which is, you know, in some ways, the single most important technological question we have to answer is how do we make computers more secure as we start putting our bodies inside of them and start putting them inside of our bodies? Like there's arguably nothing more important for us to answer uh, authoritatively than that question. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, cre the, the elevation to a virtue of it being hard to make as many copies as you want of something is uh, like the outcome of this, of this policy uh, consensus that, that emerged that we would just someday have this rentier economy 
And so in that rentier economy, the fact that like you can take something valuable and make as many copies as you need without any incremental cost becomes a problem. You know, historically, that would have been a utopian scenario, right? Like there's a thing that everyone needs and we can make as much of it as anyone needs for free. That's not a problem historically, but we, 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 we elevated scarcity to a virtue. And so thinking about post-scarcity is in that regard uh, a subversive act because it challenges the whole consensus about what a neoliberal future looks like, a rentier future looks like. Um, and so the first time I really encountered post-scarcity, I mean, I'd encountered it in dribs and drabs in the fights about software piracy in the 80s, where, you know, it was kind of, there was like some amb 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 uh, ambiguity there and there were still a lot of small independent software companies that made this, you know, reasonably convincing case that like, I'm just some dude who made some accounting software, please don't uh, make me go broke by refusing to pay for it, dun -da -dun -da -da. But, but as this like turned into the music question and as Napster came along and became the fastest adopted technology in the history of the world, and as it took the 80% of commercial music that wasn't available for sale anywhere at any price and put it in the hands of everyone who wanted it at any time, night or day, and also automatically started to create communities of interest around uh, music that was not in the mainstream, right? Because like you would find someone's collection that you thought was interesting and you'd open a chat window to them and you'd plunder their collection for things that you'd never heard of, but on the basis of them having things that you liked that few other people liked, you could assume that the, that the rest of it would be interesting to listen to. You know, this, this thing that was like so clearly just good was turned into a, a vice and, and became further the rubric for mass internet surveillance and a takedown regime where material could be removed from the internet uh, without any checks or balances. It became really clear to me that the, people who viewed scarcity as a virtue were an existential threat to a free, fair, and open internet, why ever, for whatever reason that that scarcity had become a virtue to them. And so post-scarcity and thinking about it and, and singing its praises and describing ways in which it could be great became a, a kind of cultural project in the service of economic and political projects. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about this, actually, because you bring up Napster. Um... And that's about the time when I was graduating uh, from high school and started paying attention to it. I'd been playing on computers for a few years at that point. But yeah, the things that Nutella and Napster were providing, the connectivity, the ways of, of you know, yeah, exploring other people's knowledge and, and art was just fascinating. Um, and those seemed to kind of go away in the early 2000s because of all this pressure from industries and from the FCC and what have you. Soulseek is still around, but I don't think people really use it. I I mess with it from time to time, and it's got the same the same abilities. Do you think it's just not used as much or talked about because the sort of um, snake eating its tail? People don't talk about it, so it doesn't get used as much. And because people aren't using it, people don't talk about it. Or just because technologies have like maybe the social acceptability of sharing um, sharing music or sharing art in that way has now just developed onto a different platform yeah i mean it's definitely on different platforms it's streaming now uh and uh what, what we lost you know ironically we lost a bunch of of things that would have been very helpful to the industry um so we lost a lot of the social elements like um it's much harder to have a community where you post links to music that you might like that is infringing uh, you know, you can still post to, you can still point to YouTube, but increasingly there's, there's, you know, risks of, uh, of, of the communities facing legal sanction being shut down because of uh, preponderance of links to stuff. And so what that means is that like the recommendation and the, the um, concentration of, of people who might be interested in your music as a product in one easy to advertise to place that has been very uh, eroded through these anti-infringement, anti anti-piracy uh, uh, programs. But the infringement hasn't been eroded. You know, like the, the people who will tell you that there's more infringement than ever are the people who uh, claimed that this would be what they needed to stop infringement, right? The, the record industry, their own stats 
show that their efforts were worse than useless, that they ended up with with less infringement or with more infringement, not less. But of course, their argument is, well, it would be even more if we uh, if we hadn't done all of this. And, you know, we swallowed the spider to catch the fly. Now give us some some birds to catch the spider. You know, we so once we accepted that at any cost uh, is 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 bearable in the service of defending um, music from copyright infringement, then there's the sky's the limit, right? Well, it, you know, it turns out that shutting down services didn't do it. It turns out disconnecting people from the internet didn't do it. It turns out that, you know, all these other things didn't do it. So just give us more extreme measures. Just, just you know, keep ramping up our power to be judge, jury, and executioner of people on the internet uh, and the things that they say, and eventually we'll be able to get rid of copyright infringement. The other thing that that forcing this decentralization did was it made it harder to charge rent. You know, Napster had a business model, right? Napster's business model was we will go to the record labels, we'll get a license from them, and we'll charge five bucks a month to be a Napster customer. Uh, and then we'll measure uh, what people are downloading and we'll, we'll uh, give people, we'll, we'll pay out the money in that, in, in, you know, according to who downloaded what, whose stuff got downloaded. And, you know, it was like literally a model where the more people pirated, the more money you got paid. Uh, and now what we have is this fragmented underground system that because of court decisions like Grokster that said that um, companies have liability if they know and can measure what's going on, the systems are deliberately designed so that no one can audit them and figure out which musicians to pay. So they just really shot themselves in the head. Now, they, they still make tons of money from things like um, uh, streaming services, the legit streaming services like Spotify. Musicians don't make any money from them, but the labels make, you know, gobs of money from them. Uh, and, and that's because they have these super abusive contracts. Uh, and those contracts have become more common, not less, because uh, there are fewer alternative places to brute your music about because the copyright enforcement has basically made it um, very expensive to operate alternatives to the traditional music industry. And so now we're down to like four rec four giant record labels and they all have the same <laughs> abusive terms for any musician who signs with them. And so even though Spotify is, is throwing billions of dollars at the labels, the labels contractually have to give only, you know, infinitesimal fractions of a penny, penny to musicians out of those billions. And so you just ended up with a system where it's hard for them to harness real growth, the, the labels, the kind of anemic growth that there is, they get the windfall from, and musicians are trapped in a kind of sharecropping model. Um, you mentioned that you had a children's book coming out soon? Yeah, I have a picture book. Uh, it's called Posey the Monster Slayer. Um, and it's about um, a little girl who's obsessed with monsters. Uh, and one night when the monsters break into her bedroom, she tears apart all the girly toys in her bedroom and repurposes them as field expedient monster killing weapons. <laughs> and so like she, you know, when the beholder leaps off of her bookcase and hovers in front of her with its millions of writhing eyes, uh, she uh, takes her Barbie bubblegum scented perfume and maces it. Uh, and um, at each after each monster battle, her parents come in and, and put her back to bed and say, you know, I'm going to be a zombie if you, uh, if, if uh, tomorrow morning, if you don't let me get a good night's sleep and stop horsing around in your room. And then the punchline is that they turn into zombies, uh, but the, 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 that she can't defeat, but the zombie that they can't defeat just tucks them and just tucks her into bed, right? That's, that's its attack mode is that tucks her into bed and doesn't let her get out again. And the, the, the penultimate monster that she fights is a Frankenstein's monster. And she topples it over and then uses her sewing kit seam ripper to take its head off. And uh, they tuck its head into bed with her. And the two of them share a kind of wry glance uh, that the, the, the Frankenstein head and the little girl as her parents tuck them in and turn the lights out. Uh, and so that's the, that's the cute little spoiler. ending of the story. <laughs> yeah, spoiler. It's only, it's only about, you know, uh, 100 words long. So it wouldn't take you long to get to that spoiler. Just don't tell your, your your little children before you read it to them and, and you'll be fine. That sounds like the kind of story that only a parent could write. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And the, the part of the joke, is, the running joke is the name of the kid is very long and it's my daughter's name. So my daughter has a crazy long name. She's Posey, Emmeline, Fibonacci, Nautilus, Taylor, Doctoro. And, uh, and so that's the name of this character. Uh, and every time the parents come in, they call her by more of her name. 
So like Posey, because Posey, go angry. back to bed. <laughs> yeah, Posey, Taylor, Doctor, will go back to bed. Posey, Emmeline, Taylor, Doctor, will go back to bed. And eventually it turns into, you know, the whole name. So there's a kind of cumulative, you know, kids, it's fun in a kid's book where there's like a cumulative call and response. Well, I mean, that's that's funny, too. That reminds me of Etc. from Walk Away. But what, that's what right. made you, <laughs> what, what inspired that, your daughter? Well, yeah, I mean, so the, one of the things about the kind of immigrant experience I come from, uh, it's different for different people, is that we have a lot of names. So, you know, my grandfathers had their birth names, which were usually Russian or, or Eastern European names. And then they had a Hebrew name and then they had a Yiddish nickname and then they had an anglicized name and sometimes more than one anglicized name. And they use different names depending on who they talk to. Uh, and I played with this before. I wrote a novel called Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town, where the characters have a different name every time they're referred to. Uh, and it, it's, um, it has a specific salience in this technological moment because of the NIM wars, where Google Plus and Facebook had this insistence on, their, on everyone having one canonical name that they used to face the world which produced all kinds of shitty problems, but it also sparked a bunch of really good ar uh, arguments about names. And there's a, a beautiful essay called Things Programmers, False Things Programmers Believe About Names. And, you know, it includes things like everyone has a name. Everyone has one name. Everyone has a name that can be written down. Um, everyone has a name that's unique. Everyone has a name that's unique when you factor in their date of birth and so on and so on. This has actually be also become the subject of a Supreme Court case over um, voter suppression because uh, one of the heuristics that um, the uh, voter roll purging software used was was that it assumed that it was very unlikely that two people would share the same name and the same birthday. And it turns out that for a lot of reasons, that's not true. Among them are the fact that a lot of databases, when they don't have a birthday, default to January 1st. So there are tons of people who share that birthday, but also like, guess what month people named June tend to be born in? <laughs> <laughs> or people named Carol, guess what day of the year they tend to be born on? December 25th, you know? And so uh, there's just, there's a lot more collisions than you'd expect. And so uh, I wanted to play with this idea that you could have a character that had lots and lots of names that um, would break a database. And, you know, I um, there's a joke that I told that, that got picked up in XKCD uh, about a, a, a kid named Timmy Drop Tables that whose name is a MySQL code injection attack that uh, if you try to enter the kid into the into the school rules, the school rules, you know, fall apart. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so that that, uh, uh, you know, that database breaking function of names is a really interesting thing. And it, and and names, of course, have this resonance in storytelling, where if you know Tr Rumpelstiltskin's name, you can make him do your bidding. If you know the demon's name, you can you can conjure him or banish him uh, and so on. So the the true names of things. Um, have always held power. Uh, and one of the things that the internet has been really good for and that has made the, the, um, the NIM wars so uh, important is that the internet has, been, has, has always been a place where people could have a new name. And it's enabled people, to be, because of those new names, to experiment with new identities. And those new identities are part of why we have things like gender fluidity as a thing that, that has always existed but has come into prominence because it gives people a space in which they can be fluid in their identity without exposing themselves to risk by by butting off a new identity to play with and then um when they feel comfortable about it reintegrating it into their main branch of their identity if they ever do and that that has created a real social revolution that's playing out all over the world uh it's also a force for evil, right? Like it's, you know, the, the Twitter is full of Nazis who don't use their real names to avoid reprisals. Um, we, we now live in an age in which one of the great sins that you can commit that violates the terms of service of almost everything is disclosing the real name of someone, right? We call it doxing. Uh, and disclosure of someone's real name when they operate under an, 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 uh, a pseudonym has become, uh, you know, grounds for online execution which I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that it tells you about the, and I'm not saying it's right either. I'm saying that it just tells just you commenting on the power about of it. The, the, or the name, right? And so giving a character a lot of names, I thought was, a, was, was you know, had a, had a kind of um, uh, 
currency to it, you know, zeitgeistiness. Yeah, you could almost just write a whole novel just probably telling the stories behind each of those names. Sure. Well, in his case, they're the um, 20 most popular names from the 1890 census in order, oh. <laughs> uh, which, you know, one of my um, writing techniques is that when I want to um, name a character, I use, uh, as, at least as a placeholder, I often use the census. So I, I kind of go like, I want to name that's really common. So I pick for, because the census produces um, popularity rank names. So I pick a first name and a surname from the top of the census, or I want a name that's very uncommon. So I pick it from the bottom. You know, it's a, it's a cheap and easy way to do it. That's really smart. Um, <clears throat> do you have time for one more question? Sure. Let's okay. make it quick. Okay. Um, well, maybe that won't work then because it was going to be about transhumanism. Um, but I can, I can happily. End well, let's the... give it a try. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm personally a little uncomfortable with, I'm personally uncomfortable with transhumanism as an idea because I fear that when technology, because the people who tend to wield technology tend to be the powerful people and that sort of scenario that you are breaking down and walk away around the elite class becoming gods and then denying everyone else the ability to reach that point, um, seemed like what my cynical mind would would actually see happening in the world but um can you can you talk a little bit about about immortality about technology as a means of escaping the mortal coil and maybe maybe what values you see in the mortal coil that sort of got troubled by some of the different characters like tam for instance right well so there's a really good book about this and i i i, I nod to it in the book called um uh called citizen cyborg by james hughes who's a, a humanist transhumanist. So he, he, uh, he, he has a humanist transhuman program. And he argues that it's, it's about, that the problem with, um, with this kind of transhumanism is, is uh, fairly distributed access to the technologies, not the technologies themselves. So I'm of the view that um, science fiction rarely predicts specific technological innovation well. Uh, but that it, what it does predict with incredible accuracy is the um, is our widespread social uh, fears and aspirations for technology. And so, like, I think science fiction, um, the, the, the science fiction stories that we tell that are uh, very current, that are that are very uh, that are very resonant are a kind of diagnostic tool for what it is we worry about and, and what it is we hope for, not for what's actually going to happen, except to the extent that, of course, the things that you hope for may, may happen because you might work towards them. But it's not like it's got a predictive value. It's not like we're not fortune tellers. And I think that the, um, the idea that technology will change what it means to be human has a pretty obvious corollary in what's going on in our world, right? A lot of the institutions that we define our humanity by, be it family or names or or nationality or what have you, are challenged by networked communications. And I think the fear of um, a transhuman rift between the wealthy and the rest of us feel like there might be a rift between the life circumstances of the wealthy and the rest of us that would make it impossible for the wealthy to understand or empathize or even really be said properly to be in the same species or circumstances the rest of us you know if, if if the rich never see the poor if the rich if if the a sort of mating means that the rich never marry the poor if the rich live a com life circumstance that is completely different from the poor then they are in some way speciating, even if it's not biological, even if there's even if transhumanism isn't doing it for them. And moreover, if like we live in a world in which market logic dictates healthcare, and so poor people, uh, you know, die of preventable diseases, and rich people get to live very long lives, then you know that transhumanist idea of some of us being um, medically privileged and the rest of us being medically deprived is again like not a, a difficult thing to understand um but it doesn't it doesn't require that we be literally headed into transhumanism for it to be relevant and i think that's good because i, I think that like you know so, transhumanism is a great science fiction macguffin it's not a it's like it has pretty it has very little um connection with technological reality in the biotech realm
Well, okay. Um, Corey, thank you so much for having this chat. I really enjoyed it, and I think listeners are going to get a real kick out of it. You said some really awesome things. Oh, well, thank you. Um, where can where can people in the audience find your writing and keep up on the books that you're publishing? I'm pretty easy to find. Let me check. Am I still the am I the top Corey in Google today? I usually am. <laughs> um, I'm the sixth Corey on Google this morning, uh, so I'm pretty easy to find. Corey Doctorow. Uh, I am one of the editors of a website called Boing Boing at boingboing.net. Um, Craphound.com. Crap like poo, hound like dog. Dot com. It's my personal site. You can get on my mailing list and get on my podcast. I, I podcast short stories and articles there. Uh, and uh, I have a Twitter feed at Doctoro. And, um, you know, my books are available wherever fine books are sold. I should mention that uh, if you want a fair trade ebook or audiobook, I actually retail my um, my own ebooks and audiobooks. Even though they're published by traditional publishers, They I've convinced them to let me set up a store. So I sell them at the same price as Amazon, but I get the cut that Amazon would normally take, and then I send the rest back to my publisher, and then they give me my royalties. So it's a way of effectively doubling my royalties. So if you want to in indulge in some um, uh, electronic media purchasing, that's a way to do it. Uh, one of the things that's up there right now is the audiobook of Walk Away, uh, which I self-produced and which has some really astoundingly good readers. It, it, Amber Benson from Buffy and Will Wheaton. Uh, from Star Trek and and um, uh, Amanda Palmer, who uh, was in the Dresden Dolls, uh, all read on it along with uh, several other very talented ebook readers. So I'm extremely happy with how that worked out. That's awesome. Well, and I of course, uh, that I should mention it's all DRM free and there's no license agreement. So there's no, uh, you don't have to give up any rights to buy those books. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Corey. Well, thank you. Thanks for your interest. To find past episodes of The Final Straw, you can subscribe to us in your favorite podcatching device or visit the website, thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, for eight years of free audio. If you'd like to hear us on your local radio airwaves, contact your community radio station and tell them to check out the radio tab on our website. Or you can reach us via The Final Straw Radio at riseup.net and we'll try to help in the process. We are up on the most obnoxious social media platforms and can easily be shared after we air. Finally, if you appreciate the work that we do, please consider a one-time donation via PayPal or, better yet, a recurring one via Patreon. If you visit our website and click on the Donate tab, there are instructions there, or you can visit patreon.com slash tfsr. All of our content is free, but a dollar or more a month can be very helpful to keep us going. Plus, there are some pretty awesome thank yous available. Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP at 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. If you care to, you can send us letters at our new address, The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, that's 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816, USA! This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville, specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.